there is another atomic current loop. And this one is spin. So if we're being classical, we can look at our electron. I've never drawn it that big, but let's say this is your electron. You can imagine that it's spinning around and that it's on some axis, say, like that. Electron is spinning around. Um, And it's made up of charge, so you have a volume density of charge spinning around. Therefore, that's going to have, uh, be a current, and that current is going to have a magnetic moment. OK, let's be very clear. Not really. It's not really spinning. OK? The electron, as far as we can tell, is a point particle. So how could a point particle spin? It can't. But it turns out that um, particles have an intrinsic magnetic moment in them, and it is referred to as spin to give kind of a classical spin on it, I suppose. Um, not really because it's a point particle. Well, for many reasons. It has no size. All right. But we call it spin. Or sometimes it's called the intrinsic magnetic moment because people that want to get away from calling it spin just call it that. So rather than pretending it really is spinning and doing a volume charge density integral and all that, let's just write down the, the, the value. The spin magnetic moment that can be calculated and measured is E, just like before, 2 Me h bar. It has a single value. It's not spun up faster. It's not higher or lower. That's its uh, quantized uh, value, E over 2 Me h bar. And this is sort of fundamental. You can see this is similar to the orbital value. The orbital value just had, for, the, for that L equals 1, just had a square root of 2 in front of it, basically the same value. So this is what's called the Bohr magneton. You can sort of think of it as the fundamental unit for microscopic magnetic moment. It's not really a unit, it's sort of a small expression, but it's, everything is often referred to in units of uh, the Bohr magneton. So there you have it. We have angular momentum, or we have uh, magnetic moments in the, in the atom for a couple reasons. We have electrons going around in orbits with electrons that we can imagine as spinning. And the magnetic moment of an atom is then pretty complicated. So you've got a nucleus here, and maybe you have an electron in an orbit like that, and then maybe you have an electron in an orbit like this, and then you've seen wild orbits in your chemistry book doing all kinds of crazy things like this. So all those will have different orbital angular momenta. Each little electron moving around has its own spin. And then other things in chemistry show up. You know that when you add up all these uh, orbitals in chemistry, uh, or when you have two electrons um, in an orbital, you know that they have the opposite spin. We do 1s1, 1s2, all that stuff. So the spins often cancel out. You often s2 with their spins opposite each other. The orbitals also often cancel out. So a lot of this, ang of this uh, magnetic moment you think would be building up, it's actually a lot of it's canceling. And then there's thermal motion. Thermal motion can make it cancel out. Even if the atoms, even if the moments were aligned in the atoms, the atoms are all moving around relative to each other. And then what about the nucleus? Right. What about the neutrons and the protons? They have spin, yeah. So they have uh, magnetic moments as well, but you always have this down here. You have the mass in the bottom, and we know that the mass of the neutron and the proton is about a thousand times higher than the electron. So their contributions to the total magnetic moment are pretty small. So it would seem then that all this big jumble together, you wouldn't get much magnetism in matter, and usually you don't. Right? But let's now talk about the three kinds of magnetism you can see.